Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. It, uh, it's great to see you today in the house of the Lord and great that you've come, that we are here to experience the, the life and the presence of Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, if you'll turn with them this morning to the book of 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter number 1, we are, uh, today I'm going to divert uh, from our series that we're in on the power of love, and uh, I, I felt impressed uh, for today just to share uh, a word of encouragement to your hearts, um, and the Lord brought me back to this passage of Scripture. This is such a wonderful passage of Scripture, and through my life, uh, it has been such an encouragement, and I pray today that the Lord will encourage your heart, speak to your life, and just uh, to help you pick up and keep taking steps forward in Jesus. Second Peter chapter number 1, verses 3 and 4. His divine power has given us everything. Somebody say everything. everything. So if you ever wonder, what does God give me? God gives me everything that we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who has called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. Let's pray. Father, I thank you today for your word, that it is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light for our pathway. I thank you, Father, for your word today that is there to encourage our hearts and to encourage our minds and to help us, Father, to keep pressing on and working, uh, Lord, laboring for you. Father, I pray you'll be with us today and the life of your word, Father, will come forth and touch us today in this place and we give you all the praise and all the church said. Amen, amen. The scripture says that God has made some very great and precious promises. That is not, that is not my taking on his promises. That is God's words uh, that he says about his own promises. He says they are very great and they are precious. Now, you and I can, as humans, uh, make promises, uh, but there are times that we forget. Uh, anybody ever forgot an appointment that you had? And uh, we, we forget places sometimes we're supposed to be. And if you're like me, I'll look down at my watch just by strange coincidence, and all of a sudden, it doesn't hit me until I look at my watch. And it's like, <gasps> and you're like, oh, no, I was supposed to be across town, or I was supposed to be there. And so you pick up the phone, and you're trying to call people and say, I'm sorry, I'm not there. Then there's sometimes, the truth be known, we are humans, and there's sometimes we have made promises, and we just fail to keep the promises uh, that we have made. The truth is, when humanity is involved, our promises always have the element uh, of failure attached to it. I want to tell you today, God is nothing like that. God is nothing like mankind. When God makes a promise, friend, God sticks with it. When God promises you something, you can count on it. He never forgets. He never fails. He always follows through with what he says. God's promises will always be in your life and mine very authentic. They'll be reliable. They'll be trustworthy. And they'll be something you can count on. Now, the definition of a promise is this. It's a declaration of what someone will do or not do. It is a declaration of something that they will do or not do. Now, we find that God is a promiser by nature. You can't read the scriptures without noticing that he is a God who makes promises. God promised Noah that he would never again destroy the earth by a flood in Genesis chapter 9. He promised Abraham innumerable descendants in Genesis 12. He promised to deliver the people of Israel for, from years of slavery uh, under the hand of the Egyptians in Exodus chapter 6. He promised blessings to the people of Israel in keeping the law and the commandment of the Lord in Deuteronomy chapter 28. He promised victory to Joshua over the Canaanites in Joshua 1. 
He promised an everlasting throne to David's descendants in 1 Samuel 7. The Bible, we find, is overflowing and it is brimming with the great promises that God has made. You could really say that the whole of Scripture really is one great promise that he has made to us. His word is a promise that helps to maintain us and to keep us on the right path. You find that man's involvement with God has been wrapped up always in his promises. The way that you and I relate to God comes through his promises. He promised you and I salvation through Jesus Christ. He promised us forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. He promises us healing for our lives that by his stripes, speaking of Jesus, by his stripes, we would be healed. He declares the Holy Spirit as a gift. What a wonderful gift God's given. The precious Holy Spirit as a gift, as a guide, as a comforter, all this comes through his very great and precious promises. Now, God's promises, I shared with you uh, some time back, God's promises are an assurance to his people so they can walk by faith while they're waiting on him to work. Have you ever had to wait for God to work in your life? You've asked and it was a waiting period. You've said, Lord, I need you right now. And sometimes he's immediately on the spot. And how many know sometimes there's a waiting period? There's a, an incubation period. You see, his promises are an assurance to you and I so that we can walk in faith and, and walk not in doubt, not in fear, but we can walk in faith, we can walk in power, we can walk in his authority while we're waiting on the fulfillment of that promise. His promises are like an anchor for our soul while we wait. You see, a lot of life, a lot of this life that you and I live, is that though God makes promises for us, the difficulty for you and for me is in the waiting. How many of you know we don't like to wait? The other day I was at a stoplight, and uh, man, I'm not kidding you, it couldn't have been two seconds, and the guy behind me is honking his horn. And I'm thinking, the cars around me haven't even had a chance to move yet, buddy. I mean, it's like we got to have it now. You go to the drive-up at your favorite restaurant, and if they're not lickety-split, we're out there complaining and carrying on and talking. and You know what happens in your car. Yeah. But I'm not preaching on what happens in the car. The part we don't like, we don't like the waiting. We don't like the waiting, period. Listen, if the promise was always fulfilled today or tomorrow, there would be no difficulty. But most often when there's a promise, there's an incubation period, a waiting time, a time of planting the seed and a time of uh, harvesting the seed. It's the promise. There's a waiting period before the fruition of the promise comes about in our lives. Now, the reality is that when I get in the Word and you get in the Word and we find His promises those promises are there for us to hold on to while we journey through life, while we go through the difficult things that we face. Uh, David said in Psalm, this is such a wonderful passage, Psalm 27 and verse 13. David said, I would have despaired unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. It's about hope. It's about something to hold on to. It's about a life preserver that keeps me floating. While away, he says, I would have despaired if I hadn't believed that I'd see the goodness of the Lord. And tell me, friend, today, when you're walking through trouble, how would you have made it if you hadn't had a promise to hold on to when you didn't see it coming, when you didn't see it working? But you took the promise and you held on to it and enabled you to believe that you would see the goodness of the Lord and the fulfillment of his word. That's how his promises work in our lives. Don't forget God's promises are his assurance that he gives us so we can walk in faith while we wait. And you know, God, listen, God created us. He knows that you and I struggle with waiting. He knows that you and I struggle with walking by faith when we don't see the things that we'd like to see. 
God knows it's hard for us to do those things. The Bible says, though, in the midst of that, what does God do? He is such a good father to us. In the midst of those times, what does he say? He says, I'll give you very great, and I'm going to give you some precious promises, something you can hold on to in the midst of the battle and the difficult places so that you won't get lost in that process. You see, God doesn't want you and I disillusioned. He doesn't want us discouraged. He doesn't want his people without hope while we go through difficulties. Listen, I won't ever tell you. I won't ever tell you you're not going to go through some difficulties because you are going to go through some difficulties. There's going to be some tribulations while you live. You know, when we get to heaven, no problems. Here, there's going to be problems. No wonder John said, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. There's going to be difficulties we're going to have to walk through. But in the midst of that, God knowing everything, he gave us these great and precious promises to hold on to. Let's, let's look back into our text there, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. It says he's given us his very great promises. Why are his promises great? Why are they great? I would submit to you today, God's promises are great because he is a great God. Can you say amen to that? He's a great God. His promises are great because of who has made the promise. If you today, when you go home and you guys are sitting around the table eating lunch and one of your kids pipes up and says, hey, I need everybody's attention here. I, I just have something to say. Mom and dad just want you to know, I know that this week there are some bills that are going to be paid. There's groceries going to be bought. And I want you to know, mom and dad, I'm going to pay all the bills this week. I'm going to buy all the groceries for you. And, and that kid says, Mom, Dad, listen, I know you work hard for your money. I want you to know I'm going to pay the bills this week. You can take your paycheck and do whatever you want with it. How many of y'all would spend your paycheck right away? Probably not. You see, the promise is all wrapped up in the person who's making the promise. It's the person who has the ability to back it up. It's the person who has the ability to fulfill the promise that they made. God's promises are great for him because he's a great God. Psalm 145 and verse 3 says, Great is the Lord. Can you say amen to that? Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. God's greatness is beyond our ability to fathom. It's beyond our ability to to understand the extent of his incredible greatness. He is greater than I can comprehend. People say often, they say, you know what, I don't like the fact that God did this, and, and I don't understand why God did that. And I've heard people say, you know what, God did that, and I got a little problem with that. Let me tell you something. I don't want a God who is on my level. I don't want to serve a God who's my equal. I want a God who's way above me. I want a God who's way above my thinking. I want a God who's not limited. He doesn't think like I think. I made mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes. I'm not always good. He's always good. I want a God who's much better than anything I can ask or even imagine. That's the kind of God we serve today. He's a great God. Jeremiah 32 in verse 27 says, I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Listen, the promises, they give us hope. And the promises give us courage to stand in the midst of a valley, in the midst of a fight, because I understand who my, my God is, and I know that nothing is too hard for him. He is the God who makes great promises because he's a great God. The promises are great not only because of the great promises, but because his promises cover some great issues. The promises God makes, he makes about some pretty big things in your life and my life. God makes promises about issues like fear, things that you and I might fear about, finances, our future, our families. He makes promises about doubt, what's going to happen to me? What's going to happen ahead? What's down the road for my life? Is everything going to turn out okay? God makes promises about those kind of issues. There are those who even go through times of despair and discouragement 
And, you know, despair, despair is about as bad as it gets. People say, you know what, I don't care anymore. I've just given up. Nothing in my life is going right. Nothing in my life is ever going to change. There is no hope. Listen, David said, had I not had hope in God's promises, if I hadn't had hope in my God, I would have despaired if I hadn't believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord. Friend, if you don't have something to hold on to, what's going to anchor you in the middle of your storm? How are you going to walk through difficulties? People say, I don't need God. But listen, when you go through a storm, you need somebody. When you go through a difficult place, you need somebody that will hold on to you and keep you safe. Our God is a great God. And he makes great promises about some really great things, some big things in your life and in my life. God's promises are great also because they bring us comfort. I like this passage. If you have your Bible, you can turn there with me. 2 Chronicles chapter number 1. If you don't have your Bible, it's on, it'll be on the screen or you can get it on your YouVersion app. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 11. There's quite a few scriptures here, but I want you to, to hear the heart of this passage today. Verse 3 begins and it says this, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Father of compassion, the God of all comfort. Can you say amen to that? He's the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any need with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. Isn't that good? God says, I'm going to give you some comfort. And when you've been comforted and somebody else is in need, you can comfort them with the same comfort you received that I gave you. He says, I planted it in you. Now use it to bless somebody else. He says, for just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we're distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we're comforted, it's for your comfort which produces new patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you'll share in our comfort. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. Listen to this. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God. Who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such deadly peril. And listen, he'll deliver us again. Man, that's good right there. He has already delivered me. Guess what? If it comes up again tomorrow, he'll do it again. I don't know what Monday will be, but he's already in my Monday. He's already in my Tuesday. He's already at the doctor's appointment. He's already at the meeting with the banker. He's already what I need. Everything. Whew. It says, on him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. As you help us by your prayers, that many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted to us in answer to the prayers of the many. Wow. Have you ever been through some difficulties? Ever been through some trials? In the midst of the difficulty, friend, the Bible says we can find the comfort that comes from God. That God is, listen, our God is greater than the troubles. Our God, how can I be comforted in the middle of my trial? It's because he's bigger than my trial. How can I be comforted in the valley? Because he's taller than the valley is deep. <laughs> How can I have comfort when I'm in the midst of a stormy sea? Because my God is author of the seas. He tells them when to be quiet and when to get all wound up. He's the one who's in charge of it all. We can be comforted in the midst of our trials because he's a great God of comfort. 
Number four, the promises of God are great. Why? Because they lead us into a great life. Now, does that mean my great life never has any problems? No. But listen, just because you have problems doesn't mean it's all over. Did you hear me? Just because you got problems doesn't mean it's all over. There's a great life. The person resting in the promises of God has a great life. Compare it to the person going through troubles that can't rely on God. I don't know how people make it today in the world without Jesus Christ. There's some days I've walked through some things I didn't think. I was kind of like that scripture we just read in 1 Corinthians. I didn't think we were coming out of this one. But God was faithful in the middle of it. Listen, I don't want to walk through a trial without him. I don't want to walk through a difficulty without him being by my side. The promises are great because they lead us to a great life. What does that great life mean? The person who's resting in the promises has a confident life. They believe that good things are in store for them. And if you're resting in his promises, if you're standing on his truth, and you're anticipating his blessing, friend, he's never going to let you down. He'll never fail you. He'll never fail you because his reputation's on the line. He has promised to do some things. He's promised to come through on some things. He's not going to let his reputation go by. If you get a hold of his promises and you'll stay with them, you're going to win in the end. If you hold on to his promises, the scripture says not one of his good promises has ever failed his people. These promises aren't great. But the Bible says they're very great. In fact, one translation says they are exceedingly great. They're great promises. God's promises are great. Number five, because they're greater than staying in self-pity. You ever been in a pity party? You know, you can get in a pity party with people. But if you can't find anybody to join your pity party, most times we'll have it all by ourselves, won't we? I don't need anybody to pat me on the back. I'll pat my own back. If you won't tell me how bad I've got it, I'll tell myself how bad I've got it. We are masters at holding our own pity parties. Many times we're faced with difficulty and we approach that trouble by saying, Oh me, oh my, this is terrible. What in the world am I going to do? Nobody's ever had it as bad as I've got it. Nobody's seen the troubles that cropped up on my doorstep today. Nobody knows what I'm going through. But my friend, I want to encourage you. If you're in that place of having a pity party, I want to encourage you, don't stay there. Get up and get a hold of the promises of God. And you may say, yeah, it looks difficult, but it's not as difficult as his strength. It may be rough, but he's stronger. It may be terrible, but my God is stronger than anything so terrible in my life you may say I don't know what I'm going to do but I know who holds tomorrow and I know he's holding my hand and I know he's going to keep me through the storm and he won't let me down I don't understand this trial but I also know this my God has everything under control I may not know today from tomorrow but my God has tomorrow and it's right in the palm of his hand he's never confused I'm confused he's not confused I don't know what to do he always knows what to do Grab a hold of the promises, friend. Grab a hold of the promises. Grab a hold of the promises. Take hold of them. Pull yourselves up by the bootstraps and keep marching ahead. Keep pressing on. Keep doing what you need to do. Keep standing on the promises because the promises will get you through the darkest night and the longest day. They'll take you through the deepest valley. They'll take you through the stormiest of seas. They'll stand with you in the midst of the difficulty and you can declare with all your heart, my God is greater than my present circumstances. My God is stronger than all my problems. My God will see me through this is not the end but this is the beginning of seeing God's promise fulfilled in my life you'll notice you'll notice that it says his promises are very great promises they're not just promises and they're not just great promises they're very great promises but he doesn't stop there he says they're very great and what does the passage say they're precious promises now the word precious usually comes from somebody who's lived through some life experiences the truth is when we're 
when we're young, please, anybody in this room that you feel you're young, don't take offense to what I'm about to say. But you know what? When we're young, we often don't understand the preciousness, preciousness of things in this life. It's as we walk through some difficulties, we find things are precious. You know, we don't realize how precious that person is until they're gone and they've been called to be home with Jesus. You know, a lot of years in my life, I can tell you this. I miss my dad. There's not a day that goes by I don't think about my dad and how much I miss my dad. And I'm glad today that my dad is in heaven and he's with Jesus. But I sure miss him. And you know, I think of the days. In fact, I, honestly, just a couple days ago, I was thinking about how I would call the house. And my dad always had a way. He would answer the phone and you'd talk to him for a minute. And, and when my dad was done talking, he'd say, okay, I'll let you talk to mom. <laughs> And I remember, I'm not kidding you, I'm driving down the road and I'm thinking about this and I could hear my dad's voice in my head saying, okay, I'll let you talk to your mom now. I miss him. I miss him a lot. And you know what? I never realized how much I'd miss him until he was gone. And you know what? As you walk the journey of life, there are some things that you're going to find. They're going to be precious because of where you've been. And the promises of God, you see, it's no mistake. It's no mistake that Peter would say, these are precious promises. It's no mistake that he would choose this word. Precious takes time. The things we find as Peter's writing this letter, he states this throughout the chapters there around 2 Peter. He says, he says that our faith is precious. He says the blood of Jesus is precious. He tells us that we're precious to the Father. He talks about our precious Savior. And then he talks in our text about the precious promises. You see, Peter's walked many miles and many days with Jesus. And now, in the time when he writes the letter, Jesus is gone. He's back in heaven. And Peter still walks in the relationship with him. And he again and again and again is realizing what is of greatest value. He says, he's precious to me. There are things in this life that have unbelievable value. His promises, friend, they're not like any other promise you can get. They're precious promises. You see, for something to become precious, it takes proving. Things are not precious in our lives until they've been proved to be true. The promises of God become precious for us. And when we realize and we come to the understanding of what they can do for us, that they'll do in your life, friend, what nobody else can do for you. They'll be for you what nobody else will be for you. And that the faithfulness of God will be seen through his promises. It's no wonder that Peter called them very great and precious promises. Now, there are promises that you can memorize, and they're good. But they don't become precious until they've been all you had. They don't become precious until you had no other answer and you held on and you came through. Listen, when that's happened, you won't have to wonder, where is that scripture in the Bible? You'll run right to it. You know, when people often, I share at funeral uh, settings, and probably the most uh, sought after and the most asked for uh, passage of scripture in a funeral setting would be the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Listen, there's people in a funeral saying, and they'll say, man, that's a good, good scripture. But friend, when you've been walking in the deepest valley, and he came along beside of you, when you were there in that dark night, and there was nobody else around you, but you felt his hand on your shoulder, when you were going through difficulty, and he reminded you, I am your shepherd. I'll take care of you. When everybody else left you, he said, it doesn't matter if they're all gone. I'm right here with you. Friend, when you walk through a time like that, the 23rd Psalm won't just be a good passage. It'll become precious to you. It'll become very great to you. It'll be something that just is a lifeline to your life. He says they're very great and precious promises. Promises are great because we've experienced them. And we can boldly declare with the word, the promises are yes and amen to them that believed. 
but they're precious to us because it's through the scriptures we heard the gospel and we were saved. They're precious because they brought you through a valley. They're precious because they kept you in the darkest night. They're precious because they were to you what no one else could be. I think Psalm 34 and verse 8 sums it up well. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Man, when that happens, friend, oh, you won't have to worry about, can I find me a scripture to stand on? You'll have a lifeline in the midst of your situation. I have tasted and I've seen. He's been faithful. I can tell you, listen, I can comfort you with what I've been comforted with. And I can tell you his promises are precious because they've been precious. Let me tell you what the Lord has done for me. And friend, I'm no person of any importance. What he does for me, he'll do for you. His promises are very great and precious. I want to ask you today, are you walking through some difficult times? Are you faced with some circumstances that, frankly, you don't have the answers to? Have you maybe got a doctor's report that scared you? Do you have a situation that's arisen in your life that Man, it's just like a huge mountain that you can't see over the top of. Are you walking through some tough times? I want to tell you something, friend. His very great and precious promises are for you. Each one of you that are here today, his promises are just for you. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Father, Father, for how it guides us. I thank you, Father, for how your word leads us. I thank you that it is a lamp unto my feet and your word's a light for my pathway. I thank you that your word and your promises, they never fail us. And Lord, often though we don't understand our circumstances and we don't understand why we're having to go through the things we're going through, Lord, sometimes we're just in the middle of a difficult place and we're just standing there saying, why? Why me? Why now? Why does this always have to happen to me? And we're confused. Father, I pray in Jesus' name in the midst of that setting, Lord, would you just come in right now and would you just reaffirm to them, God, that their life is in your hand. And that you're taking care of them. And that you're going to see them through. Lord, you never promised that the road would not be difficult. But you promised that you'd be on the road with us to comfort us and help us along the way. You never said that we wouldn't go into the fiery furnace. But you did say, I'll go in the fire furnace with you. And I'll be with you and keep you. I will be the good shepherd. I'll be the good shepherd that restores your soul. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you, you said. Father, would you reaffirm that in their hearts today? That they're not without hope. They're not without life. Because they're trusting in you today. Father, I pray these things in your wonderful name. Amen. Amen. And amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Here's how I'd like to close our time together today. I don't know, friend, what your week's been like. You know, uh, most of you I haven't seen since last Sunday. And I know that in seven days, life can throw a lot of curveballs at us. And I don't know maybe what you're walking through today. But I want to remind you that he'll walk with you through it. I just want to remind you today, friend, you're not alone. He's not left you. He still loves you. And he's going to help you through this. And how, here's how I'd like to close today. Our hope is in him. If you'd like prayer today, maybe you're walking through something tough. You say, I'd just like for somebody to pray with me today. If that's the case, Paula's going to be singing here in just a moment. And as she does, I'd like to invite you to step out from where you're at. Come around front. We'd love to have the opportunity just to agree together in prayer with you. Listen, friend, you don't have to walk this by yourself. Let us stand with you. Let us believe with you. Let us trust God with you. 
So today as Paula comes, if, if there's anyone here and you say, I just like prayer, it doesn't matter how small the problem or how big the problem. You say, I'd just like for somebody to pray with me today. Friend, if that's you, I'd like to invite you as she begins to sing, to step out from your at and let us agree together in prayer with you today. are to us. Thank you, Jesus, that you are always with us, that you said you would never leave us or forsake us. Thank you, Lord, that your promises, they surround us and they strengthen us. Thank you, Lord, that you go before us and that you are behind us and all around us and that, God, you are always with us. And we praise you today, God. We thank you for all the times you've taken care of us in our past and in our future. And God, we just give you our life all across the house. Will you say with me, I trust you, Lord. I trust you, Lord. I trust you with my life. I trust you, Lord, with my job. I trust you, Lord, with my family. I trust you, Lord, God, in school and in every situation I'm in, Lord. I trust you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Lord. We give you praise today. Now can we let a spirit of thankfulness roll through the sanctuary as we just begin to tell the Lord the things that we're thankful for and how great he has been to us. Thank you, Lord, for your provision. Thank you, Lord, for your salvation. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for taking care of us and for always guiding us and helping us, Lord. Hallelujah. Lord, I pray for the congregation today. I pray that you would make them be men and women of prayer. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen them to make them men and women of the word. Lord, I pray they would
would be bold witnesses for you. Father, I pray that they would never tire of doing good and that they would run the race set before them with the cross always in front of us, that we would shun sin and cling to the cross. God, I pray for the congregation, Lord, that you would bless them indeed, that you would enlarge their territory, that, God, you would bless their family, their finances, bless their relationship with you, and may every good blessing come to their life and their family in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Can we tell the Lord, I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. Your sons and daughters, we say we love you. We love you. We love you more than anything or anyone. We love you, Lord Jesus altars remain open just want to tell you how much pastor jerry and i love you just want you to know that we are for you and we encourage you to be people of prayer and we encourage you to never tire of being people of the word and may god open doors of opportunity for you to witness to someone this week and we encourage you to shun sin and cling to the cross of christ May God bless every step and every day of your life this week. May you shine the glory of God to those that you are around. And may everything your hand touches, may that thing prosper in the name of Jesus. Be blessed this morning. We love you, and Jesus loves you very much.